Hello. Hi, Aaron. How's it going? Good, how are you? Good. All right, Brandon. Hey, Brandon, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. So uh, you're going to be monitoring the chat. So if there's any questions, right? Angela will sort of be doing that, but I'll be, I'll watch it too. All right, because I'm not looking at that at all. And yeah, I, you guys don't have to do that. We'll take care of that. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. We, um, we had a few questions submitted in advance, uh, mostly mm -hmm. for, um, we've got two Joes with us today, mostly for Joe Parisi. Um, but then we might have some on the way. And so we will keep ourselves on schedule, you know, um, today. Joe, we um, certainly know you guys, you have a previous commitment at noon, so we'll, we'll keep yeah. you on track. Okay, great, thanks. And um, Brandon, you can kind of, we can wait a few minutes. This is about, we're about halfway to the people that have registered, so we'll just wait another minute if, if we can. Welcome to everybody that has uh, logged on so far. For joining us today. I believe you said there's about 80 or so people that registered today. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's great. We also have um, FACT TV with us, which is our uh, community access network, um, Joe and Scott. And so they are recording the video and they'll be sharing it um, multiple times with our, our resident community too. So right. thank you. So let's see, we're about 11.32. I think we're gonna go ahead and get started today. So I want to welcome everybody today for um, the Fitchburg Focus meeting. Um, we have uh, four guests with us today that are gonna give us some community and economic development updates from both the county and the Fitchburg local level. Um, just some housekeeping notes. We will be hosting these Fitchburg Focus updates on a regular basis, and they'll be the fourth Thursday of each month from 11.30 to 12.30. And so you can kind of set your um, calendars to that. We want to make sure that we continue to stay connected with each other, with our business community and with our residents and with our leadership. So um, that'll be the fourth Thursday of each month. And you're all very welcome to um, give me a call. I'm happy to talk to people, not just emails. Um, so give me a call if you have um, uh, some thoughts or ideas about who you, who you want to hear from and who you want to talk with um, as we move through the summer and the fall. Today, we um, are certainly gonna talk a lot about um, our opening up our economy uh, under the guidance of um, the recently released Forward Dane plan, um, phase reopening plan from the Dane County Public Health. And uh, we are um, also gonna talk about some other, some other updates. But I wanna welcome our guests today. Uh, we have Dane County Executive Joe Parisi with us today. Welcome, Joe. Hi, thank you. Um, his uh, 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 right-hand person, Scott Adrian, is also from the County Executive Office. He's here today with us. We have, um, oh, there he is, <laughs> Mayor Aaron Richardson from the City of Fitchburg. We have our Fire Chief, Joe Paltermarker, from the City of Fitchburg, and our City Administrator, Pat Marsh, from the City of Fitchburg. So thank you all for joining us today. And um, we're gonna start with our County Executive Office and, and with you, Joe, today. We understand you have a previous commitment at noon, so we're gonna keep you on track and um, keep you on schedule. And um, we appreciate you taking some time to, to speak to us today. So welcome. Well, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate you, you allowing me some time to, to come and talk to everyone today. I thought maybe it would be helpful. I, I know that folks follow the news and you've been aware of what's been going on kind of countywide, county response over the past few months. But I thought maybe I'd give a quick 30,000 feet on our major um, efforts countywide leading up to where we are today, then I'm happy to answer any questions or touch on any issues that, that, that I didn't, that people want more information about. Um, you know, it's, as you know now, it's, it's, you know, the phrase gets used a lot, but it's the new normal. But three months ago, we had no idea what was coming. Um, Dane County the, uh, was the first um, county in the state and the 12th location in the country to have a positive um, case of COVID-19 identified. What that did is it kind of kicked us into gear before a lot of other folks. And, and that actually turned out 
um, to be a little bit of a silver lining because now we know in retrospect that the, the faster people act to address um, the situation around COVID-19, the better our odds are um, in the long run of keeping the numbers lower. So we actually put in countywide guidelines um, before the state did. We began limiting um, the size of gatherings. And soon after that, um, the, statewide, um, the, the statewide guidelines went into effect. Like most places, we um, you know, had to take care of you know, the, the house internally um, first and get people you know, into safe working conditions. It was quite a heavy load. You know, countywide, we have 2,400 employees. Um, many of which, the majority of which, have been able to work remotely, um, but a number of our folks, due to the nature of the services we provide, just can't. And we are the social safety net for so many people. Um, you know, we have a nursing home, child protective services, um, et cetera. So we have a mixture of people working remotely and people um, working on the scene. One of the first things we needed to do um, when it became evident that we had community spread and we all became more aware of how, how it is spread and the challenges of having you know, congregate settings and large numbers of pieces, people together was we looked um, to protect our more vulnerable populations. And one of the more vulnerable populations um, is our homeless um, population, particularly um, when folks are spending days and nights in shelters um, in close quarters. Also, a lot of our, our neighbors who are experiencing homelessness have underlying health conditions um, due to the circumstances in, in which they've, they've been living um, and, and the poverty they've experienced. So what we did initially is we moved to get every single family that was in shelter into hotels. Um, we did that relatively quickly, and then we set out to identify the single um, folks who were still in shelter who had the worst of the underlying health conditions and to move them into hotels. As of today, we have over 400 individuals that we um, are, are putting up in hotels across the county. Um, we're keeping them in hotels, providing um, some, some wraparound support, making sure they have enough to eat and that there's counseling available for them. And what all this movement has done is it's freed up space um, in the shelter system so that we can um, achieve um, safe social distancing in the shelters. So, you know, the folks who were involved in that really did an amazing lift and I believe likely saved a lot of illness in a lot of lives. And so they really deserve a lot of credit. So another thing we saw was a lot of people losing their jobs really quickly. And we saw the demand for basic necessities, food, shelter, et cetera, um, increase sharply. So we set out initially to help on the food side of things um, by partnering with Second Harvest Food Bank. And we were faced with a situation, ironically, in which we had a lot more people um, in need of assistance with food when we had our farmers having to dump milk because of supply chains that were broken and, and, and demand that, 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 that they had disappearing overnight. So we successfully built a bridge between our farmers and local growers and the community of folks who need a little help with food. Um, and we partnered with Second Harvest Food Bank um, to the tune of $3 million over the next 90 days um, to procure food for folks in the community who need it and to get as much as they could locally. And our initial um, reports are that about 95% of the food so far that's been um, purchased with those funds has been sourced locally. So that's um, a way that we can get a little bang for the buck with the dollars that we're investing, not only helping the folks who need food, but helping those farmers. Um, and just like our farmers, as, as everyone on this call knows all too well, our, our local businesses have suffered greatly during this pandemic. So we also launched a small business relief fund, um, the total of which is, is now $10.8 million invested, um, partnering with Dame by Local to distribute grants to um, locally owned um, companies to kind of give them a lifeline to help them as much as we could um, survive through the roughest parts of the pandemic. We did a similar program also with child care providers because not only do they work on very thin margins and we're hit hard, but we know that for any kind of recovery, we're going to have to have child care um, in place and, and statewide and nationally, a lot of child care providers are in pretty tough shape. So we um, partnered with a $3 million grant with Community Coordinated Child Care, um, who is administering this grant and basically we designed it so that every single one of the approximately 500 licensed child care providers in Bain County will receive a grant. Um, and if you're a licensed child care provider, you get the grant. It's, it's about that straightforward. 
and it's based on your size. The smaller, the smaller, smallest grants are about fourteen hundred dollars. The largest grants um, are fifteen thousand um, dollars. So then, you know, the the final piece of this that we've addressed in a in a pretty big way has been um, the challenges that that renters and their landlords are facing around um, eviction. You know, when, with so many people already in challenging places, and then the impact of COVID nineteen, we've seen just record amounts of need. Um, from renters um, just in order to stay to stay in their apartments. And so what we've done is we launched a another program. It's an eviction prevention program. It's a $10 million partnership um, with the Tenant Resource Center. We're providing the $10 million. They're administering the program. And we hope to reach about 9,000 renters countywide with this. And the, the TRC will work with the renter and with the landlord um, to, to, to fashion agreements that allow people to be able to catch up in their rent and stay in their homes or apartments, and then the payments will be made directly to the landlords. In addition to that, we put another $500,000 into our joining forces for families, the, the county's human services um, folks who are out in neighborhoods, into their eviction prevention fund, so those dollars will be available. And then the final piece of this initiative is a partnership with Catholic Charities um, to provide them funds to hire four housing navigators. And what these folks will do is they'll work with the folks we have, um, mainly um, the, the people who are staying in hotels who are homeless to work to connect them with landlords who are willing to rent and to help them get started. We've also provided about $250,000 in funding that can be used for that you know, initial security deposit and first month's rent because you know, finding a place is one thing, but especially if you've fallen on hard times, you know, having those first couple months of payments can be really challenging. So we're hoping, you know, we, we can't fix everything, but we're certainly hoping that these efforts will alleviate um, a lot of the challenges that are out there in the, in the rental community and with people suffering from homelessness. Uh, I think I'll switch to the Align Energy Center um, now just quickly. So as you know, just like a lot of your businesses out there, once this hit and things started shutting down, everything shut down at the Align Energy Center. So we have done our best to um, utilize the center for COVID response. Um, it's being used by Second Harvest. It's part, part of our food partnership. They're warehousing there. We've leased um, four refrigerated semi-trailers for them to use for cold storage um, for the local food that they're procuring. Um, and as you, and you may know that the, the weekly um, farmer's market on the square has now been moved to um, the Lion Energy Center where people can go get it, dial in ahead of time and order their produce and drive through and have it put in their trunk for them. And then finally, we have a couple of directly COVID related, excuse me, um, initiatives going on there. It, the Lion Energy Center has been identified as a place for a field hospital should we need to stand one up. And you know, with the guidelines being you know, kind of thrown out the window, um, thrown out the window just basically with nothing to replace them we're seeing record numbers of cases statewide um, so we really can't walk away from the potential that we might need to stand up a field hospital there yet we hope to avoid it but we have to be prepared because dane county doesn't necessarily control all of our own destiny when it comes to hospital capacity because particularly uw hospitals you know so many people feed in regionally from other counties and from other states and as you're likely aware, we've also um, partnered with the National Guard to stand up um, a, a mass testing facility there. And so I would encourage anyone who hasn't, if they'd like to get tested, it's really easy. Um, a COVID-19 test, you can just drive in, you stay in your car, you get the test, and within a couple of days, you have the result. And that mass testing was, was kind of the last really important piece we needed before we could move into our phased reopening into phase one, because we were meeting the metrics that public health felt we needed to meet, um, except for the number of tests we were we didn't have a big enough sample. And so now that we're, 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 we've, we're getting a lot of testing going through, we're getting a sample size that public health is comfortable with um, that has allowed us to dial in to um, move into phase one of a phased reopening. So our approach to, to the reopening um, initiative is is first and foremost based on the advice of public health experts. Um, you know, I think our, our we we certainly recognize the need to balance um, our response to COVID with the the genuine needs and the the, the 
the suffering that, that the economic hardship has brought on um, with people. Um, so we want to do this right the first time. The last thing we need to do is to start reopening and then have a huge spike in cases, hit hospital capacity, and then have to shut things down again. So we think it's important to be deliberate and to move slowly. We want to move. We want, you know, we know people need to, you know, restart their livelihoods. Um, you know, it's, it's our belief that if we do it right the first time, that's going to be what's best in the long run for everyone in our economy. Um, so, you know, we hit, we hit the milestones that we needed to and the criteria. And as you know, the phase reopening has begun. There, you know, there are definitely different parts, you know, that we could go into for different types of businesses. But in general, um, what it means is folks who have, you know, non-essential businesses now can open at 25%. Um, percent. Um, there need to be guidelines, there need to be certain practices in place regarding masking, sanitization, physical distancing, and that sort of thing. And so what we will do is we will wait at least two weeks between phases because of the incubation period for the virus. We want to see how things are going. Um, and again, we're going to be cautious. We want to move forward, um, but we want to do so in a responsible way that doesn't end up um, making the virus spread. Um, even more and kind of putting us back to where we where we began. So another piece of this moving forward, what's going to be really um, important is to continue um, our ability to do the testing and do enough testing and to trace the positive cases to, to make sure we can contact folks that someone who's tested positive has have been in contact with and give them the help they might need quarantining. So we've beefed up um, even even more, our public health department, with um, they already have about 150 employees. Um, we beefed up their budget by another um, $700,000 so they can hire even more folks to work on infectious disease and contact tracing. Um, we'll be, you know, we announced yesterday a program through which the county is going to provide free testing for all first responders throughout the county, um, and folks can reach out to Dane County Emergency Management um, to get those those test kits. Um, the kits are being um, manufactured and read by Exact Sciences um, of, of Dane County. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice local team. So it's a quick turnaround. Um, we need to do everything we can to you know, protect the folks on the front lines, that's for sure. And then we'll have other testing initiatives in the coming weeks that we'll be announcing as we continue to build out our capacity to keep track of how things are going. Um, I think maybe I'll stop there. That's kind of the roundup that brings us to where we are today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And if I don't know the answers off the top of my head, we, we're happy to follow up with anyone individually or to the, to the group um, with, the, with the responses. Thanks, Joe. Um, sure. You did a really good job of kind of touching on, uh, so we had a few questions in advance and you touched on just about all of them. Um, uh, certainly the, um, from the business community, the Dane County Small Business Grants that's being administered by Dane by Local has been um, uh, really appreciated. Do, do you have an update, uh, Joe, on where that is in terms of funding? Or um, it, it, I think application deadlines are June 15th. I know that's probably a question more for Colin of Dane by Local, but maybe yeah. we'll give an update. Sure, sure. That is, yeah, June 15th is the deadline. There will be a total of $10.8 million that, that, that we have put toward that. Um, as of today, I think about 4 million of it is out the door. Um, you know, there, as you can imagine, they've got a lot, <laughs> a lot coming in and they continue to work really hard to push that out. So we're really hopeful that that'll make a difference for folks. Um, you know, our goal is throw people a lifeline, help them survive until they can start bringing in more money. So it's, it's, it's been a good partnership. That's great. And, and kudos to Dane by Local and we know, like uh, everyone on this call um, working 24 seven, we know they are too. So great. that's a great partnership. Um, we had another question and you really did touch on this about um, our, our most vulnerable populations and um, what you're doing as what you're doing as a county, which really sounded like you know, Herculean efforts um, in a quick amount of time. But uh, the question also centered on what would you like our residents and our businesses to think about um, you know, for our most vulnerable populations? And um, are there people that we could connect with to assist? Yeah, so, so some of the other work we've been doing, we're, we're doing testing in all of the long-term care facilities um, where we, we've tested in Badger Prairie, the county's nursing home, there are no positives there. We had to shut that down, unfortunately, to visitors early on. And, and you know, the, the question about the vulnerable population is really important because while everyone 
um, is susceptible to serious um, implications from contracting COVID. Um, it's really, it's, it's our vulnerable populations, it's our elderly, it's our, you know, folks who might be on dialysis or chemotherapy or that have any, you know, a number of underlying conditions um, who our efforts are really aimed at protecting. So, so when we are careful in public, I, I still think the best thing any of us can do, and again, sometimes it's, you know, doing nothing is actually doing something, it's, you know, because we all want to get out there and do something. You know, I, if folks still can, for the, the, the most they can do to stay home, to do things remotely, to be super careful when you're out in public, wear a mask, keep that six feet of distance, um, you know, washing your hands, everything that we know about still is still incredibly important because, you know, as we know, this virus is still here, it's still contagious, it's still deadly, there's no vaccine and there's no cure. So really, what, what we're doing when we wear a mask, when we do proper physical distancing, is we are caring for the vulnerable people in our, in our, in our community. And we're really doing that for them. There are some opportunities still, I think, you know, if folks are interested, there are meal programs, you know, Meals on Wheels and that sort of thing has been, that's where the community has stepped up in amazing ways to help reach out to some of our elderly folks who, you know, have depended on for a long time for, for food and for social interaction, um, you know, congregate meal sites, um, which we don't have right now um, for the foreseeable future. So, you know, taking care of yourself um, and, and, and then if there are volunteer opportunities that, that you're comfortable with, um, such as helping deliver meals on wheels, that sort of thing, um, it's, it's all welcome. That's great, thank you. Um, and then I guess uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna let you go here. We have one last question and it'll probably require your crystal ball. So do you need okay. to <laughs> top up and grab that? But you know, uh, it's summer, it's Wisconsin and so, um, People are looking ahead and um, looking at our events that we uh, make up such a part of our identity, right, as, um, as Wisconsinites. And uh, this question was, about, um, again, really concerned for some of the artists, the charities, the nonprofits that benefit from a lot of these events. Yeah. And the question relates to stage three and moving into stage four and how likely it is that, um, you know, we will be able to host uh, or we will have a, um, I guess what was the status kind of a, uh, I don't want to say a cure, but a reasonable protections to move into stage four. Um, you want to address that a little bit? Sure, sure. And, and you're right. I mean, that's, it's anyone's guess. We don't know how this is going to evolve, when and if a cure is going to come, when the vaccine will be in place. But, you know, to be perfectly honest, this will not be a normal summer or a fall. Um, this is a time when there's, we're all going to be called on um, you know, to sacrifice um, in, order to, in order to keep this virus in check. And I don't want to mislead anyone and, and try to paint a rosy picture that everything's going to be back to normal because frankly, my opinion, and this is just my opinion based on what I know, I'm, I'm not a public health expert, we're not going to see normal um, until a vaccine is available and widespread enough and that's probably at least heading into spring. And there, we are going to continue to have to rally and come together as a community and, and particularly realizing that, you know, the, our, 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 our adversary is the virus. And sometimes, you know, the, things get stressful and people kind of go at each other, but, but we're all in this together. And it's going to be a very challenging time and we have to do what we can to support our small businesses and our artists, et cetera, um, through this period of time that will probably last, you know, close to another year until we really see things going back to normal. And, you know, no one likes to say that out loud. I don't like to be the, you know, the, the bearer of, of, of bad and challenging news, but, you know, I'm being as honest as I can based on what we know. And what we know is we have an incredibly serious virus that's out there, that particularly heading into the fall and the winter, if we also have a bad flu season, um, could put us all in an extremely challenging situation. So this thing isn't over. We, we have short-term good news and we're hopeful that if we're deliberate in our phased-in approach and we do our contract, contact tracing and the people adhere to the guidelines, our goal is to be able to keep on the path that we're on. But I also don't want to be Pollyanna and just pretend like this thing's going to go away. We're going to have to stick together and see this out, but one day we will be on the other side of it. It's going to take months. But 
my hope is a year from now, we come back and have this meeting and we look back at how this community came together during the worst of times and got through it together and did everything we could to minimize suffering and the loss of life. Thank you for that, Joe. Um, we are going to let you guys go, or uh, Scott, you might be, are you going to, Scott, Adrian? Scott's gonna stay. <laughs> Joe, thanks for your time, and we thank will you. welcome you back anytime. And um, thank you to not only you, but your entire team for your leadership during this time. Thank you, I really appreciate everything you all are doing too. It's, it's a community effort. So hang in there and take care. Great, bye Joe. So um, great, uh, next we're going to move on to Joe Palvermacher, Chief, um, Chief, the Fire Chief Joe Palvermacher from the city of Fitchburg. And kind of a nice segue, Joe, you can give us some um, health and safety updates from the local Fitchburg perspective. Yeah, I think one of the, uh, the important things to note here is uh, 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 Joe Parisi talked about the vulnerable population and one of the things that we also appreciate is there's a vulnerable population in small business. Well, business in general, but small business seems to be vulnerable and it's in our best interest to try to address uh, things from a local perspective as far as how we can reinforce versus enforce. Um, we, we don't necessarily want to put ourselves in a situation where we're being restrictive but we do want to provide an educational element that allows people to appreciate the, the gravity of the situation and not take things too lightly. I mean, there's a delicate balance between optimism and realism. And optimistically, we want to get back to work. We want our businesses to succeed. We want to be able to advocate and support that on the, uh, on the, on the emergency management side. But we also want to make sure that spread doesn't happen any more than it already has. Um, so from an emergency management standpoint, I'm not only your fire chief, I'm your emergency management director. We look at things from a readiness, re uh, response, and recovery aspect. We're trying to move from response to recovery right now. And recovery suggests that we do so in a way that doesn't take us right back to where we've been. This virus is still very much active. Um, and some of the group gatherings that we have seen are concerning because of the fact that we don't want to go back to where we were. Uh, we want to do everything we can to keep people in business and keep uh, business open. That based in approach is there for a reason. Uh, we, we, we see the value of getting back to business, but we don't want to compromise safety. So from a coronas, uh, coronavirus uh, standpoint from emergency management, we're looking at monitoring control, protection, the, uh, the reduction of spread and education. We want to make sure that we provide that conduit and not, you know, between business and, and resources, best practices, networks, and problem solving. One of the benefits that, that we have here in the city of Fitchburg, we have an active economic development team through, and, a, and a highly educated economic development director who is able to get resources out there. What we have the ability to do as a city and as the chamber um, has already alluded to the value of having a chamber is the ability to be able to reach out and coll collaborate with businesses, our corporate citizens, the people who help make things happen in the city and can advocate on our behalf. So from a public safety standpoint, from an emergency management standpoint, from a readiness standpoint, we rely on those business owners to make appropriate decisions. We're there to, to provide the information that is needed we're very grateful to be able to, to, uh, to recognize um, some of the, the, the work that has been done throughout the county already. Uh, and we're here to, to stay active in making sure we understand the current events, um, things that are, are happening with the virus in our area as local as possible so that we can make appropriate decisions and only enforce things or put things in place that really need to be and allow business owners to do what they need to in order to, uh, to grow their business and, and to succeed. So with that, I don't necessarily want to, uh, to belabor um, my, my role here because I think the important information is gonna be coming from the mayor. The, uh, the thing that I do wanna say is you have a lot of municipal services that are working on, on in the best interest of the municipality. Uh, we have public safety who is dedicated to making sure 
that we do what's right and we're there to, uh, to provide uh, support and service to those in the city. Um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll yield the floor. Thanks, Joe. Um, you know, just a, a quick question. Um, are there additional resources that you guys are referring to or using for health and safety measures um, for reopening other than the WEDA guidelines um, and forward Dane um, public health guidelines? One of the things that we, we continue to do is we evaluate all of the, uh, the different uh, levels of participation, federal, state, county, local, um, there's a lot of good information coming out. Not all of it trends the same way in our area. For example, things that are happening on the East Coast versus the West Coast are not the same in the Great Lakes or in the Midwest. Um, WIDA has, has put out an excellent document. We are using that uh, extensively, but I can tell you that uh, the City of Fitchburg Economic Development Director is doing his best, Mike Zimmerman is doing his best to stay on top of all of those things that are available to uh, to business and small business. Great, thanks, Joe. Um, I think we'll move on to uh, Mayor Richardson now. Welcome, Aaron, Mayor Richardson. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, why don't you? We did a couple of the the city, um, as Joe alluded to, the Economic Development Department and, and the Chamber have been really talking uh, daily with dozens and dozens of businesses um, since, you know, the mid-March mid during this pandemic. And um, uh, last night, or was it last night? Two nights ago? <laughs> <laughs> um, council uh, approved a couple of items that were, that uh, we are hoping um, based, you know, those programs were designed based on, on business feedback, right? Um, what they could use right now. And so why don't you talk to us a little bit about those those things and any other updates we have from the city um, that would businesses for business resources or assistance. Yeah, I'm really excited about these two programs that we approved Tuesday night at our council meeting. Before I get into those, I originally also want to thank uh, Joe Parisi and his office and staff for all the work they've done in leading the whole county during this time. It's been extremely challenging, but I think that you know you see how fortunate we are to have such strong leadership. So you know, again, thank you, you know, Joe and the entire staff. And really from a city perspective, I don't know how much people in the community recognize and realize how great our staff has done throughout the board. Every single department has really stepped up to continue operating and providing the services that all of our constituents need, whether it's emergency services, uh, Mike and Joyce working with the business community and Angela, who you know, all, all know and love, even people like our IT department to get the resources to our staff so they can work from home and don't have to come into the office. So, you know, really every single department has been able to really step forward and we're really fortunate actually as a city. So thank you to all those people. Uh, two programs I really want to talk about right now. The first is uh, you saw in today's paper, Madison just yesterday uh, expanded outdoor seating for bars and restaurants. We were actually ahead of the curve. The article did not give us that credit. That's okay. I'm okay with that. Uh, but Tuesday night, we've been working on this for a while. For bars and restaurants, you know, in phase one, they can only open at 25% of capacity inside. And we heard from some businesses that that really isn't enough for them to make it worthwhile. And so what we did is we are actually enabling those businesses that are interested to expand their outdoor options. And so if this is something that you might want to do, uh, we have some more details for you but this is really trying to make up for some of the capacity you maybe would lose inside and be able to expand that. And whether that's into some parking spots or if you have a grassy area, wherever that might be, there's some restrictions. Obviously we still need access into the doors there. You can't take up the handicapped parking stalls, you know, there, things like that, but it's something that we want to make available for our businesses to help them out during this time. There is a process that you have to go through and we are actually going to have a special council meeting next Tuesday night to approve the first wave of people who apply for this. So if you are in that situation, if you can apply by noon on Monday, June 1st, we will have our number of people from the uh, city look at that application to make sure that uh, everything is okay and that's building inspection and fire department and all those types of people so we're going to look at that to make sure that everything is set up right 
but then uh, they'll review those. And then Tuesday night, the council has to approve those. I asked our lawyer to let me just approve everything. And she said, no, I can't do that. So that's all right. But we'll have as council a special meeting Tuesday night to officially approve those. And so and that's something that we want to do and do as soon as possible for that. Now, if you don't get your application in by noon on June 1st, still get it in. Uh, just the next week is a regular council meeting and we'll approve those hopefully then on that Tuesday night. And there's different things like we wanna make sure you have fencing around that new area. And I think uh, Angela at some point here can talk about a couple of local businesses that might be able to help you with things like fencing, additional tables, seating, stuff like that. But it is something that we want to do and implement as soon as possible to really help out those businesses, especially during this phase one. Now, we are going to allow this throughout the summer, and this will go through Labor Day, this expanded seating area. So that is something that uh, even as we move into other phases, it's not like you have to get rid of this. Uh, we are allowing that through Labor Day. If you want to permanently expand, you still have to go through that regular process. That This isn't taking away that process. If that is something that you want to do on a permanent basis, you still have to go through the regular process for something like that. So. I did want to make sure people knew that that is an option as well. Um, other than that, I think those are the, the main things. Probably the other thing that I just want to mention is that uh, a, a solemn permit is not part of this. And so if you do decide you want to expand seating, that doesn't mean that you can start playing a lot more music outside or have musicians playing outside. We want to be respectful to people who live near these uh, resident, uh, these places of business. Uh, you can apply for a solemn permit separately and go through a regular process. But at this point, uh, we're really trying to be sensitive to people who might live close to those businesses. And so that's not a huge distraction. And you're just really trying to balance those two things for that. So that's the first program you know, really targeted for the bars and restaurants in the area. The other one is what we're calling the Ford Fitchburg Business Boost Loan Program. And this is a loan program for small businesses that are located here in Fitchburg and up to 25 employees, full-time equivalents. And you can apply for a loan up to $10,000. And it, this can be for whatever you need to do to get your business kind of back running full speed. And we're not putting much for restrictions on this, but it is going to be, you can apply for up to $10,000. You no know, interest, no payments through the rest of this year, but then there will be a 1% interest on this loan. First payment would be in January of 2021, and we're looking at a two year, 24 month payback for that. You can pay back sooner if you want to, that's no problem. Um, but that's something that we wanted to offer. We have $150,000 in this fund that we are offering out there for Fitchburg businesses. We're taking this out of a different revolving loan fund that we have, but this is not money we're getting from the county, the state, the federal government. This is something that we had here in Fitchburg and want to provide to, again, try to get our businesses going again. Uh, you have to be in business for at least a year and then also prove that, you know, kind of before this hit, that you weren't struggling at that point. We don't, you know, this isn't to help a business that's struggling live along a little bit longer is for those businesses that were, you know, doing well, doing great. This happened and no fault of anyone, but we really want to make sure that we can help you kind of jumpstart and really be successful and really come back stronger after this. Um, let's see, for this program, the deadline to apply is Friday, June 12th at 4.30. And we do have a committee that will review all those applications. Mike and Joyce are on that committee. No elected officials are on that committee. So don't try and lobby us for that. But you know, we're really interested in seeing what the interest is from the community. If we have more than $150,000 in requests, then we might go through then. And um, you know, if someone asks for $10,000, we have to give them less. Uh, we'll look at that because we really want to help as many businesses as possible. If there's 15 businesses that all want $10,000, okay, great. But if there's 20 businesses that want $10,000, well then we have a shortage. And so that loan committee will really look to figure out how to you know, f do that at that point in time. So we do have that program as well. And uh, all those materials, I know that 
Angela, you guys sent out some information on that. And so that's available as well. So the chamber can help you with that. Mike and Joyce can help you with any questions you might have about that. So those are the two big programs that are happening. And then we just approved, I'm really excited about offering. Um, one other thing not related to those, uh, Mike asked me to mention this, uh, that he's got a lot of questions about the post office over at Hallmark that's open, that traditionally has been open. Uh, there is some signage up that they are gonna, they expect to be open by the end of the week. And so I know that's something that a lot of businesses were worried and concerned about with that post office. And so that's another thing that is opening up uh, later this week. They expect that to be open according to what they have on their business. So again, more good news and ability for you to do even more business and get hopefully back to normal, at least as close as possible. Oh, Angela, you're on mute. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Darren. Um, you know, as far as that business boost program, one of the things that people you know, some people might not be aware of when we were talking to business owners, um, you know, the, the it, it's not just about the lost revenue during this closure, but the impact on um, putting in safety precautions and um, sanitation measures to open safely. And so that's a, that's a fairly finan big financial impact in and of itself. Um, and a lot of our, most all, all of our businesses, I would say, have really taken a great care and concern to do what they can to um, put as many safety measures as, in place as possible under the guidelines that that we've just talked about. But um, you know, just talking with one restaurant owner, just buying enough sana hand sanitizer for um, you know daily use by not only all the employees but customers, you know, that that can be hundreds of dollars a month alone. So it's um, you know, anything helps, and um, we are glad to see this this option available, and um, and uh, appreciate council's quick decision on that. So, thank you. Anything else from the mayor? I don't have anything right now, but if there's questions after Pat's done, I'm happy to answer okay. the questions then. Well, then we will um, finish up the hour with uh, city administrator Pat Marsh and. Um, Pat, um, some of the questions we've been getting um, have been things like uh, like the question about the post office, uh, you know, what's going on at the senior center, what's going on at the library, um, what kind of opening plans do, do those city departments have? So any anything you want to share with us on that? Yeah, definitely. And uh, thanks, Angela, for coordinating this. And uh, I'd like to echo what Mayor Richardson said, um, you know, it's we're in this position where we're gaining ground because of great leadership uh, through people like County Executive Parisi, our mayor here and council. Uh, we've, things have changed a lot in terms of the way we're operating, obviously, but as the mayor noted, we are getting uh, the work done. We are serving our customers, which are our residents and our businesses on a daily basis. And um, that's something we really want to continue the uh to improve on but um at this point i'd like to just start with um stating that um you know we have 270 employees in the city of fitchburg and i'm happy to say all of them and their families are healthy right now and uh that's all good news and uh, you know we wish the best for uh, all of our residents out there too um the current situation we're in which the mayor noted earlier is that the majority of our staff is working remotely, those that can work remote. We obviously have police, fire, EMS, uh, public works that are out on the streets and, and they're, um, they're working uh, somewhat normal, I guess if you can say normal at this point in time, but they're responding to every you know, emergency situation as if it was just three months ago. So a lot of credit to those individuals that are uh, basically putting themselves out in front of this storm and uh, doing a great job. Uh, in terms of the city city hall facility, uh, we are we are closed now to the public, uh, but we are uh, operating uh, by appointment only for people that would need things like um, building permits. Um, they would need any zoning um, changes or uh, applications for zoning amendments things like that, uh, people that need to come in for their pet licenses, uh, 
register to vote, all that stuff you can do by appointment at City Hall. The uh, library, um, one of our facilities um, here on our campus is locked down a little bit more than that. Um, they are doing um, uh, pickups for our residents and uh, people that use our library. They can pick up their books on a uh, drive-by basis. We're not taking any returns at this time, but um, uh, you know it's, it's the best that we can do. And we're sort of following the county's guidelines when it comes to the library and the senior center because of the, uh, you know, we're not, we're not experts in public health and the, and the county does have some of those experts. The um, senior center, which probably get, is getting the most attention and the calls, I think a lot of those seniors out there are missing each other and for good reason. You know, that their interaction is something they look forward to on a daily basis here and our senior center staff does a very good job um, working with them, not only on a social basis, but also working with them uh, when it comes to uh, counseling, uh, personal hygiene, uh, assisting them in other ways, whether that be housing or meals, et cetera. So that's something that um, we're getting a lot of calls from the senior population about when are you going to open, you know, when are we going to have our exercise classes, all that, those good things that they look forward to. But we got to remember too that um, we, we need to be very careful with that population. That's a population that's very much at risk. And we do not want to put them in a situation that's any more um, dangerous than we need to. So we're gonna, we're gonna follow the county's lead when it comes to the senior center. I know our staff's chomping at the bit here to open up too. They miss, they miss the uh, seniors and recently had a parade, drive-by parade for our senior uh, residents so that they could you know at least make eye contact with individuals um, I guess moving forward what we're doing moving forward and that was more of the question so I apologize on taking a while to get to that but moving forward uh, we're looking at a soft opening July 6th that soft opening of City Hall uh, would also coincide to like departments like the police department uh, potentially some increased hours at the library depending on uh, what the county decides but on july 6th we plan on opening up from eight to noon and we would have coverage within all departments that doesn't mean that all staff will be working here at city hall what it means is that we'll be able to assist the public um, with any of their needs people can come in and talk with a building inspector without making an appointment people can come in uh, for questions on their assessments uh, without an appointment. Uh, all those things I was stating earlier that we had by appointment only, people can do from eight to noon starting July 6th. We are going to, um, you know, require that these individuals, when then they come in, they comply with social distancing. Um, we will have a lot of signage in City Hall and already do uh, to facilitate that. And um, we do ask that people that are coming in from the public would wear masks. Uh, we're, we're not requiring it, but we're strongly encouraging that. And we're also encouraging that of our staff too, that whenever we're meeting face-to-face -face with the public and can't comply with the uh, social distancing requirements that we wear masks. So that's sort of where we're going um, moving forward. As you know, all of our meetings, all of our public meetings are taking place via Zoom. Uh, public are welcome to come to City Hall. Our meetings are always open to the public. Uh, we would require that those individuals sit, uh, you know, a minimum of six feet apart. We do have overflow rooms with uh, uh, TVs so that we can keep uh, the room capacities at 25% or, you know, thereabouts. Um, we just want to keep uh, those meetings as safe as possible. Not many individuals have taken advantage of those meetings to date. Most are watching them via FACT TV and we're, that's a great asset to the community. But um, if anybody did want to come in, I didn't want to think them to think we were restricting that. So um, that's where we're at and that's where we're going. Angela, I would be happy to answer any other questions you might have.
So uh, thanks, Pat. Um, I think you touched on all the questions that were, that were sent in. So let's just a, a follow up. If people want to make an appointment, they call to call the main line 270-4200, right? That's correct. Yep. And uh, if we do have staff in um, that they will transfer directly to the staff. If not, we would get a, a message to a team member. Great. And uh, um, I'll echo your sentiment that FACT TV is a great resource, especially now more than ever, that people can um, uh, follow meetings live or online at a later date. So that's, that's a, real, a real help to um, our businesses and our citizens. We did get one question, and uh, Mayor or Pat can answer this. Um, thanks for doing this webinar. We really love this city. Are there any specific things residents can do to contribute and support the city during these three phases? How often do you get that question? Yeah, it's, it's, good, to hear, it's good to hear the positive comments, but I'll let the, may, I'll let the mayor answer first. Yeah, I think, you know, right now, the biggest thing is supporting the Fishburg businesses that are, you know, slowly opening. That's probably the biggest thing for me is just as much as you can support those local businesses. I know that, you know, there's a lot of people out there in the community that, you know, are, are struggling a little bit at this point in time, but we do have resources and the county's been great in providing some of those resources. Um, I think, you know, maybe the senior center might, you know, need some volunteers once in a while to deliver meals, or I know there's some people that they kind of contact once in a while just to make sure that the people are doing well. Um, so I think, you know, the biggest thing is really supporting local businesses as much as possible. If I can, you know, I think Joe maybe has some has something to say too. Yeah, I, and and if I could just add to that, I you know I think the number one thing we need you to do is to be patient in regards to some of our openings of our facilities. We're getting a lot of inquiries about uh, you know parks and rec programs, uh, splash pad restrooms, you know all things that the people of Fitchburg have learned to love. That's one of the great things about Fitchburg is we have great uh, programs. We have great outdoor facilities, but we need to make sure that we're complying with what the county is doing with these phases and make sure that we're opening these facilities safely. We do not want to put the public in danger, nor do we, we want to put our staff in danger. Excellent. Thank you. Well, this looks like a good place to wrap up. I want to echo um, uh, Mayor Richardson's sentiment about supporting local businesses. Um, that includes, uh, cur uh, you know, supporting them in person, curbside pickup, delivery. Uh, it also includes online shopping. We we have a lot of our businesses have moved swiftly to invest in um, platforms where you can get the same products and or service uh, online. So um, it's just as easy to shop online with a Fitchburg business as it is maybe a, a national company. So. Um, we appreciate everybody's time today, and uh, we will certainly stay in touch. And thank you for joining us. And um, if anybody has any follow-up questions after today, feel free to contact me, and I will get them to the appropriate people. So thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, from the, uh, Scott, from the mayor, the county exec's office. Thanks, Angela. Thanks, Angela. Thank you. Bye-bye.